But we've got to have the men's education and history education. We've got to do that. And I also think the history education builds empathy across cultures, builds tolerance. That's what we're missing today in a lot of our political discourses. I'm right, you're wrong. But in studying history, we, we, we learn about different points of view. And we're aware of the evidence, and we learn to have civil conversations. Because that's what good, I think, good history, good history, history, good, good history teachers do. So that's what I was just talking about, maybe using a Maryland Historical Society, about ways to have good, safe conversations about history here. That's, that's the war. Because too many people are not learning anything about history. And so they just spout out platitudes. And so we really need to do that. And I wrote an uh, essay for uh, Antiques and Fine Arts, about historical literacy. And my point was uh, that if somebody's going to go to what Greek revival is, they got to know what Greek revival is, and I said, it's not a fraternity. <laughs> you know? Well, what is a federal kid? And what's that federal reserve? What, what you, you know, the things that we use in common parlance. Or 18th century or Renaissance or what, what is this? What, the difference between the Civil War and the Revolutionary War? These are things we use in our everyday conversation. So we 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 need to that, that's that's the war. And so uh, and I'll talk maybe talk about that further. But wrote an article for Antiques magazine about it. Just about uh, uh, Drayton Hall's collection. We think because because the house is not furnished, that does have collections, but it does. It has a significant collection. Uh, of, uh, of, of, of decorative arts, thanks to donations from the Drayton family or things that we've acquired uh, at, uh, at auctions. Here you see the 18th century porcelain, Delft uh, tiles, and also this uh, desk and bookcase uh, that's now on exhibit uh, at, the, uh, at the at Williamsburg in the exhibit Rich and Varied Culture, Material World of the, of the Early South. This is before restoration, this apron uh, needed repair. Uh, Chippendale chairs and uh, early 19th century uh, uh, linen press uh, from Charleston. So we have significant pieces uh, of, uh, of, 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 of decorative arts in our collection. Uh, and we're, we're in the first phase of building the Vista Sun, and then the second phase we'll have exhibit spaces for all of these. Um, but I want to talk about how we can show these things uh, even without exhibit spaces. Um, but this is a desk and bookcase. Here it is un unrestored, and here after Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg restored it at the tune of about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand uh, dollars. It's now on exhibit in the uh, exhibit that I described, uh, a rich and varied culture. Uh, it will come back at Drayton Hall in two thousand and nineteen, uh, and hopefully uh, it can be on exhibit uh, there. Ron Hurst, vice president of collections at Williamsburg, says one of the finest pieces of colonial furniture that he's seen. This is the drawing room at Drake Hall, as it appears today, with that Prussian blue paint, uh, the, the mantelpiece, uh, the, the, the mantel had been stolen. And here we see it, and, and also the, the hand-sculpted ceiling is original to the 18th century. Our architectural story was on staff with the Colonial Williamsburg to learn about 3D technology, and working with computers and computer system design programs. And she recreated that room uh, using research that had been done by weather tour uh, paint uh, uh, researchers. And we found that that room had been painted originally a taupe. And at that period of time, what was fashionable was to have one plane of color, not to have the, the, the window openings, door openings uh, glossy, but to have one plane. And here we see that 18th century desk and bookcase computer simulated in this interior as if it belonged there. Here we see a china cabinet uh, that no longer exists. We had the 1840s drawing of it. Only this apron remained. But she took that drawing, recreated that place in the room, and then infilled it with our collection 
of 18th century porcelain. So now visitors can go on a tour of Drayton Hall equipped with iPads with a guide and see this room as it appeared over time without changing the original. So it's a way of using technology to interpret the past. So you can do this with rooms, you could also do this with exhibits, you could also do this with landscapes. Sites are also being used to heal the racial divides. Uh, Mount, uh, Mount Vernon is an example of that. We've done that this kind of work at Drayton Hall. Here's Charlie Drake, the last owner of Drayton Hall, is now 98, with Rebecca Campbell, who's a descendant of the slaves from Drayton Hall. And according to uh, Rebecca's family oral history, their family came over as slaves with the Draytons in the 1670s. So you see three centuries of American history parallel to one another on that chair. And we're interviewing them about their recollections and their thoughts about, uh, about Drayton Hall. This is a vi audio to videotaped oral history that we did. In thinking about perspective, and you have that interesting exhibit, uh, uh, structure and perspective. Thinking about perspective, and I included this, because when you're talking to different people, you get different perspectives. And here you see Danny Brown, whose ancestor also came, was part of that family, same family, came over the, in the 1670s with the Dragons. Her grandfather lived in the caretaker's house, and since been moved to his now museum shop, but when she would come out here in the 1950s with her family, she would look up, and from her perspective, this was the big house. That was the main house where her grandfather lived. And the mansion was the outbuilding. That was the outbuilding. And so you, it, it's sort of refreshing. And, you, know, you, you see things from different perspectives as you, as you look at the dark side. I want to just take a, this is kind of a side, but I think it's important because how we as historical organizations respond to tragedies when they, when they occur uh, in, our, in our communities. And uh, uh, after the shootings at, at uh, Mother Emanuel uh, in June, June 15th, uh, 2015, uh, a member of our board, uh, Liz Austin, was a parishioner of that. And I, I've been down to the, to the church to pay my respects, and I'm a Vietnam veteran. And as I was, saw people leaving artifacts that reminded the Vietnam War, and I called uh, Liz that Saturday, uh, shooting to a Wednesday night, and I called on Saturday, I said, does the church have any plan for uh, saving the artifacts? And she said, George, I'm a historian, but that, you know, we're so caught up in the midst of grieving. We, we don't have a plan. And, but what can you do to help? What can we do together? And I said, well, let me get some friends together and see what we can do. So here we are, and back there, I'm signing a, a banner. And there's a wonderful artifact I can find. And here's one of the awful moments in contemporary American history was the tragedy itself, that act by Dylan Roof. But you can see the response of people is America at its finest. And so what can we do to preserve that history and it, so it doesn't just go by the way? And so we organized a group the next Wednesday night, you know, when next Wednesday, um, a week after the shooting. So we were in the same place where that shooting occurred. In fact, there were bullet holes in the ceiling of us. There's John Hilbert from the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation, Faye Jensen, who's uh, Mark's account point, account chief scout part. She's director of the South Carolina Historical Society, and that's the descendant from Drayton Hall. She is Liz Austin, my friend, who's on our board, and a parishioner. So we got together and said, what can we do? We formed a committee, and we began saving these artifacts uh, in, in front. And we saved over 6,000 artifacts that were left either in front of the church or that had been mailed into the church. And there's just the cross and some of its details that I think are emblematic. Of the, of the response from people. We have added exhibits using those artifacts. Uh, this is a quilt. Uh, these quilting squares that you see are from all over the, all over the world. This is Lonnie Bunch. 
with my friend Liz Austin looking at artifacts out in front. That was in 2016, we had another one in 2017, and this is Lonnie Bunch, uh, director of the National Museum of African American History, looking at these exhibits and was so very much touched by the response of people, not just in Charleston, but from around the world to the tragedy uh, at, uh, at Mother Mangle and voicing their hopes for a brighter future, that hate will not conquer. Hate will not come. I wrote an essay as a result of my work, and it's coming out, it's just out now. Uh, commemoration is the title of, of, the, of the book, and commemorating tragedy of Mother Emanuel. And it's about how museums can respond to tragedy in their own communities, and in so doing, help heal, uh, help heal wounds. And I've also worked with those from uh, from Orlando uh, and, and other museums as well. Just also thinking about sites uh, at the new National African American uh, Museum is the Freedom House that's shown, if you come up the ramp, that's it right there, Freedom House. It's from Maryland. It's a two-story log house built in 1874 by uh, African American uh, landowners and that's indicative of their struggle um, for freedom. That's the way it appeared. This was the original house here. It was added to, on to over time. Um, that was a photograph of mine in 1979 when I was working uh, for the Maryland Star uh, Trust. Here's that house on exhibit, people going into the exhibit in the house and seeing uh, uh, photographs uh, of families, that, but there's much more that I think needs to be done to better interpret that house. And this woman right here, um, Chanel Kelton, was, grew up in that house, was born in 1983. And I asked her, she came to a reception, this was the opening reception, and I asked her, I said, Chanel, if you were teaching the docents to give tours of this house, what message would you want them to convey? And she thought, and then she said, life is hard. There are going to be ups and downs, but you've got to have faith. And she was very, very uh, a faith-driven person. You've got to have faith. But she went on to say, my grandparents, she lived with her grandparents, they didn't have much, but they welcomed everybody who came to this house. Everybody had a place for dumb. And she said, this house may be filled, may be made of logs, but it was filled with love. It was filled with love. And these are the kind of messages I think that we can get as we talk to people who were actually there, who, who grew up there. Uh, this is the house that's appeared, and that's Paul, that's Paul Sims, and that's me. Uh -huh in 1979, <laughs> and here are relatives of that house who were born during slavery, uh, and his photographs I copied, thanks to that survey of the Maryland Star Trust in 1979. So those photographs enable us to people the past. It's not just abstractions, it's real people. And I have a manuscript that I'm looking forward to getting published, and I have over 560 slides of copies of photographs and places a lot of those places no longer exist and so forth. Um, and so we work on that to see how they can be digitized and then use that to, uh, to tell the story uh, of African American history of Montgomery County and by extension uh, in, in Maryland and, uh, and, and across the South. This is the Love and Charity Hall um, built in 18, 1914 as a self-help organization. During the period of segregation, African Americans turned into their own communities for support. So this was an insurance company. Their burial insurance for you know, so support orphans, uh, widows, and so forth. There's also for dances and, and meetings and so forth. This is how it appeared in 1979. There it is today. Uh, a survivor, Barry. 
good news is that that is now going to be restored. And here we are, groundbreaking on October the 2nd. I spoke there uh, with support from the county, uh, from the Maryland Historical Trust. Um, so that building will now provide a home for history uh, in the county of Kansas people that you've just seen. And, and possible links, hopefully links, to the house at the, Smith, at the, at the Smithsonian. So just sort of in, in, in conclusion, I want to you know, make these points that, that buildings don't preserve buildings. People do. You have to step up. Oops, let me back up. Historic sites are reaching out. Historical organizations are reaching out. We've got to engage our communities. We can't just stay within our, our four walls. And, and I've talked to Mark earlier that really is pushing uh, in that direction and needs your support. Um, uh, to, to move in those directions. And we can look at history from multiple perspectives. And then to be a good bridge builder, you've got to understand both sides. You can't just stay on your side and expect the bridge to be built. There's no such thing as a one, one sided bridge. You've got to understand both. So we've got to step out of our bubbles and understand different people, different cultures, and, and bring them to the fold of a start preservation. I'm going to conclude with this uh, a section of a segment from a DVD that we produced with the History Channel. And it's part of a tour of a, of a landscape that we did uh, to take people from place to place. So we looked at uh, Drake McCall from multiple <coughs> perspectives, from members of the Drake family, from African American descendants, from African American historians. For me, as a preservationist, architect, historians, and others. So, you, and you, you toured the site. Uh, the uh, program won the South Carolina Governor's Award for Historic Preservation and also an award of American America's uh, Association of State and Local History. Uh, and, and so, we partnered with the, with the History Channel um, in producing it. And well, what I want to, the reason I want to show this for you is it gives the personal story behind preservation. Preservation doesn't happen just to have, somebody's got to step up. And preservation about choices for the future. And the Drayton's made choices. And John Pierce helped me make choices. And so I want to conclude with what choices are you going to make for start preservation? If we could show the video. And this is that one segment as you went from station to station on the landscape. This is this is a one 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 part. in-depth architecture for those who really, and this, if you're not interested in that, you move on to the next station. So it's, it's, it's business driven.
one of the most recent additions to the landscape is the Drayton Family Memorial. In a quiet, secluded corner of the property, current and future generations of the family can, as Charlie Drayton says, come home. I just, I doubt, I had thought about it but never pursued it, but my other daughter called me up one time, she lives in Georgia, and she was nervous and said, I want to cross the river. I said, what in the world are you talking about? I said, well, when I die, I'm going to be buried in South Carolina, that's where I start, that's where I'm going to end up. And I want to be buried in Dayton Hall. The monument has many symbolic links to the house and site. The Drayton, inscribed on a slate marker, was modeled on an 18th century brand from Drayton Hall's collection. And the individual white stone markers are Portland limestone, the same type of stone used in the original construction of Drayton Hall. Mary Jeremy Drayton was my wife for many, 64 plus years. Very stylish. I'm not opinionated. But just a wonderful, wonderful down to live with. And that's one of the reasons. I have two other major reasons and several better reasons. I'll let Anne tell you about Garnet, her wonderful, wonderful husband, one of the finest men I ever met. My brother and I really didn't decide and make a decision to sell the property. But people knew that we had it, that we were not going to be able to maintain it. But I did have a phone call from someone who wanted to buy it. I said, What are you going to do with it? He said, Well, we'll make it into a clubhouse and put a golf course or something like that. we so, with the interest of the National Trust children and the historic Charleston Foundation providing, we made that decision, and that's one of the great decisions we made. I remember being eternally grateful to my father and his brother for making the decision to turn Drayton Hall into the National Trust. Grateful because it was a decision made by your head, not your heart. And I tend to live by my heart and not my head. So I think it was the right decision. And I will always appreciate it that very difficult decision was not laid on my shoulders. So, the house is where it needs to be. It is being preserved, it is being cared for. We're no single family, even no amount of money could be poured into this and say that the way it has been. And it's been open to the public and she buried it.
why will it drink and not burn? Well, why was Drake Hall? The question is why was Drake Hall not burned uh, during, during, during the Civil War? Um, we don't have a good answer for that um, for several reasons. One is that uh, when Union troops passed through the area, and when they, they torched Middleton Place, which is just five miles up the road, and we know that Union troops had torched it, when we look at the official records, of that of that regiment, it's not cited, so they didn't write it. They didn't write about it. And then the, the newspapers, the Charleston newspapers, had fled the, the city, so it was no press available. Um, it's the the different accounts um, that we have, um, and one is that may have been used as a hospital. We know during the Civil War, it was used as a hospital. Um, uh, Charles, uh, one of the John Drake, Dr. John Drake, who was a uh, the, the member of the Drake family, one of the owners, uh, was a doctor in the Confederate Army, and they used it, did use it as a hospital. Uh, it's also thought that when Union troops passed through, that the members of the Drake family posted it as yellow fever, and, and uh, without signs of you know they were yellow fever, but, uh, and so Union troops didn't come through. I doubt that happened because this is. February 1865, and by that time, Union troops had been up and down the, you know, the, the coast and seen so many tricks played on them that I don't think they would have bought that. And we we have uh, an account of a Union Army physician who came by at that time, uh, visited Drake Hall, described Drake Hall, and doesn't mention anything about the seas. Uh, so we, the, the long, the short answer, we don't know. But I think it may it may have been because it was used for a hospital, or maybe the Union troops just ran out of time. But we, but we don't know. But fortunately, it was the next door, middle of the plantation next door was torched, uh, which was a great plantation. Magnolia was torched. Uh, Milton Place was torched, and other plantations across the coast of South Carolina and through South Carolina had been had been uh, torched. And I, as you heard my introduction, I grew up in Atlanta. Um, and uh, Sherman was a little careless with matches. Um, <laughs> and, and, and um, so uh, I, I did not think a lot of Sherman when I was growing up. Um, but when Sherman hit South Carolina after capturing Savannah in uh, Christmas of 1864, he wanted to end the war and felt that South Carolina had been a hotbed of secession, and by God, they were going to feel the, the, the heat of, of, of war. And so uh, he, that's one of the reasons his, his, his soldiers were deliberately vindictive when they passed through South Carolina and torching these plantations. And, um, and then when they went into North Carolina, they didn't burn anymore. They didn't burn through North, through North Carolina, but, but South Carolina. And he wanted, Sherman wanted to end the war. Um, he felt that uh, uh, the strategy was he was going to be the handle, grant, the hammer, and crush Lee's army between the two. And the more they could demoralize the Confederate Army to show their government could not even defend their hometown, home, home places and home towns, then Confederate soldiers would be demoralized. Um, so that was the strategy behind it. Um, but why Great Hall specifically was spared, but we just don't have the, the evidence we, we've had. Uh, we, we had a whole fellowship of a, of a historian devoted to that question, and he couldn't come up with an answer. And the reason that the evidence just doesn't exist. The Union Army didn't keep records of that kind of uh, uh, behavior, and there was no press to record it, no Confederate Army. So, and the Drakes had fled. Yeah? Are there any records of what the slave village around Drayton Hall looked like? Uh, we don't have, uh, we have some, some uh, well, plans, if you, some site plans to show where they were located in the 19th century, but not the 18th century. We do not have any elevations of them, um, but we we are we, we look, we're looking for them archaeologically, and uh, we uh, well, we haven't found them yet. Uh, we have found uh, evidence of tenant houses, the, the, the postbellum tenant houses. In fact, we excavated one, and a man who lived in that house. He was born in 1908 and lived in. We did. Um, interviews with him as we uncovered artifacts. In fact, he told us where to dig. 
And then he described the landscaping around it, the, the gardens, the hog, hog pen and orchards, and that sort of thing that were there. But we haven't found the, eight, the site of the 18th century slave quarters yet. Um, they probably, you know, there also would have been house servants who lived in that, who lived maybe down on the first floor in the, on, on, in the basement, maybe in the, in the, in the attic above. And of course, uh, younger slaves may have lived in the uh, girls' boys may have been in the in the bedrooms as well, sleeping on trundle beds. Um, but we, we have not found evidence of the slave slave quarters. Now we have found the material culture. We have found evidence of condo ware, for example, the low fired pottery uh, that was made on the site. We have found uh, uh, evidence of that and some other, other material evidence. Uh, but not the houses themselves. And um, that's something we really tried to look for, uh, but, but haven't found it yet. Yeah. Well, a personal question. In the early 90s, probably 91 or so, I made a trip to Charleston to visit some fake family friends, the Stonies, down in Charleston. And they took us for a tour in one of the plantation houses. And all I can remember is this colony in the front. And uh, one of the floors was missing. It was a totally unrestored place, bare walls. Yeah. One of the floors was missing. You That's right. Looked down. That's right. And down on the, I guess as I perceive it from the front, it might have been right, right where your number two was. Down the lower left corner was a, an eight-holer necessary. That's right. That's brick, it. brick eight-holer necessary. Yeah. Maybe it was six or seven. I don't know. No, there, that, was, that was straight down. Well, that was that straight down. And the second floor, <laughs> we, 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 we had taken, we removed the flooring of that second floor okay. because we were concerned about the ceiling below. Yeah. And so we, we built a bridge, a cantilever bridge that just yeah, passed over that. Wood that timbers in that yeah, and we did yeah. so we and, and then we've since stabilized that so that's, that's secured. And then the uh, eight holder is that. Yeah, uh, it's brick 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 house. Brick, 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 we have a drawing of it from the uh, well after the Civil War is converted into an office so it's no longer of, of printing. But we have a drawing up in the 1840s with the eight holes, and then in the center were two uh, holes of York with arm, armrests. <laughs> kind of, and, to, and then off to the side, at each end, were little low seats for the children. Um, so, and we've excavated that and found the number of artifacts. We found that that was one of those sort of early flush toilet systems, and that the uh, at one end of the, of the building uh, was a boxed uh, opening open, and then it was sort of piped, if you will, below the seats, and then fit that, uh, the waste went from there out to a vaulted drain field, and then from there over to a ditch, and then from there to the Ashley River. So water was poured in that open box to fill that box with water, and then that water would flush through uh, the pipes underneath the, uh, the brick line uh, uh, pipe uh, underneath the, the, the cemetery, the bridge.